Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us for Bookbound 2020, a from home literary festival. My name is Azadeh Moveni, and I'm here to host a discussion between the authors Pip Adam and Guy Gunaratna. This event has been curated in partnership with Wasafiri Magazine to raise money for the UK based mental health charity Mind and the New Zealand based charity Changing Minds. Mind provides advice and support to empower people experiencing mental health problems, and their statistics show that on average, one in four people will experience a mental health problem in a typical year. And 2020 is not a typical year. So you can make your donation to Mind using the link uh, to the Bookbound Just Giving page, which you should see displayed uh, just below. And you can find out more about Bookbound, Wasafiri, Mind, Changing Minds, and our authors by visiting our website at bookbound2020.co.uk. So now on to our event. Um, Guy Gunaratna is the author of In Our Mad and Furious City, uh, which won the Jollick Prize, the Dylan Thomas Prize, and was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. He is based between the UK and Sweden. Pip Adams' most recent novel is called The New Animals, uh, which won New Zealand's top prize in fiction in 2018. She has published a short story collection and a novel called I'm Working on a Building, and she lives in New Zealand. Um, I'm really delighted to uh, be in conversation with both of them um, and have enjoyed mightily um, reading their work uh, and becoming acquainted with it more closely. Um, there are a lot of parallels um, in their novels uh, that we're going to get to, um, but I'm going to start by asking Guy, um, and, and I'm sure he's asked about this a lot, but um, what drew him to the premise of his novel, which is set in 48 hours, um, and it sort of takes as a part of its premise um, the, the murder of the, the soldier Lee Rigby um, in London, and, and you've talked before about being disturbed at identifying with him. Um, and one of your characters says, when we saw the eyes of the black boy with the dripping blade, we felt closer to him than the soldier boy slain in the street. Um, I think else, somewhere else it says, terrorism never felt so close. Um, I'm completely compelled to, to understand um, what you're exploring with this in your fiction. Um, I've read that you were disturbed at, at identifying with um, with the killer of Lee Rigby, uh, but were you trying to humanize uh, the killer or the monster to kind of try and make what he did intelligible? Um, what were you exploring um, with this premise uh, in your novel, In Our Mad and Furious City? Um, thanks, Lily. Um, I think, as you said, it really was um, the killing Lee Rigby that inspiration isn't the right word, but the, it, did, it did spur me on to to write the thing. Um, there, it was something about seeing one of those videos, if anyone remembers the, the viral video that came out just after that killing, um, of someone asking one of the killers, Michael Adablajo, why he had done just, what he had just done just moments after he'd done it. Um, um, and just seeing the image of him um, speaking in the way kind of like I used to speak as a, as a, like a young Londoner um, dressing almost the, the, in a similar way. And he looked like someone I went to school with. Um, and that line, terrorism never felt so close. It was one of the, the first sort of what's called the a lone wolf killing um, of that kind um, um, in England or honestly elsewhere. So it, something about that, um, you use the word compels, it was almost a compulsion. It was something I couldn't not write about. In terms of what I'm exploring, back then it wasn't really a, a sense like this is interesting enough to to explore, and this is the specific things I, I wanted to sort of interrogate. I I kind of went with the feeling of of being disturbed. Um, I think a lot of my thinking now is sort of shaped after the book is done, um, and just sort of seeing it all held together somehow. Um, I th I think that the interrogation of of what it means is why why it's a human compulsion that we're so compelled by extremes in general um i think that that's that's really what i wanted to to look at um it's a very human compulsion to be um excited or um again compelled by walking the line in terms of what you believe you're capable of or um what you believe that you're not 
Um, I think that that line is is um, thinner than most than most people um, can understand. I think it it was a weird sort of confrontation almost with myself, and also just uh, in terms of um, the larger narratives around religious extremism and extremism in general. Um, there are many characters in the book, and each one sort of confronts a, a version of extremes um, in a way. Um, um, aside from that, the exploration is is a is a in, I mean the the subject matter is is heavy, but to to get up every morning and, and think about language in that same way um, and how language is inherited and social conditions are inherited through language, in terms of extremes. That was has always been sort of I guess intellectually interesting for me to explore, and over the course of writing a book, that it has to be on that level to for me to sort of stick with it. Um, and just to follow up, um, I wondered whether you had um, you know after the book was published or while you were writing it, um, you know, did you anticipate this um, and and feel you know any potential like anticipatory reaction to that? Um, you know, any kind of flack for trying to take such an act or to kind of, you know, to portray or to in, in any way kind of bring that kind of violence into fiction. Um, it was, uh, it reminded me, um, there was a play, the National Youth Theatre in London commissioned a play on what was driving young people, like homegrown extremism, what was driving young people in London to, to terrorism and, and, and to jihadism. I um, mean, in the end, that play um, was banned by the police because, you know, it really reminded me, when I was reading parts of your novel, it reminded me of this play. Um, and in the play, there was sort of sy sympathy, like, well, not even sympathy, what you're talking about, which is this like very disturbing identification with um, uh, the one of those, um, they called them the Beatles, the ISIS killers. And I think that was the thing um, that that gave, well, or as it was explained, gave pause in, in not allowing that play to even be put on was this idea that it's too volatile. It's too right. volatile to even acknowledge that identification. And did you get any reaction to that? Were you were you fearful of that? Um, because it's sort of dangerous territory. Um, I I haven't. Um, and at the beginning, honestly, aside from the fact that I never thought it'd be published, or you know, I was exploring what I needed to explore, and um, everything else sort of was a surprise to me. Um, apart from this, aside from that, the the notion of of it being almost an absurd idea that to confront or interrogate um, a human compulsion through fiction or literature in general is something that should be avoided is it sounds kind of crazy to me. Um, if you create art out of something um, that exists out there in the world, you don't, and, and if you ban that art, you don't get rid of the 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 issue that you're artistically commenting on it that doesn't make any sense um I, I i haven't come across that as yet <laughs> um and i don't think i i, I would i i think it, the the book is 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 framed in a way to 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 really talk about the 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 element of conflict within a person i mean in one sense it's religious extremism quite directly in one of the characters and then the way it's um in terms of uh, compulsions around on physicality, um, Selvon's character, his body and other people's bodies and um, and how that comes into play. Um, and so I think uh, looking at that issue almost like a prism in, in all these different sort of interpretations or almost variations on a theme, mm -hmm. I hope makes it um, makes it uh, accessible in a way that if it, if it was zero, like super laser focused onto one thing, um, uh, um, read that close, I, I, I hope that um, that wasn't, wouldn't be a reaction. Okay, thank you. Um, Pip, um, turning, turning to, to you and, and to your novel, which is also set within um, a, quite, um, a quite discreet world, um, and it transpires over um, also a very tight, finite period of time. Um, I wanted to start by asking about, um, about the center of culture in your novel. Um, it's very much set in the Auckland fashion scene. It's wonderfully satirical. Um, there were there were lines that I admired and I don't know if I can ever think of leather in the same way again or even wear it. Um, wonderfully visceral. Um, 
uh, and it seems to contain, you know, some very pointed views um, on New Zealand as a society and a place that's changing. Um, so I wondered if you could describe a little bit um, the role of nationality or Auckland um, as as a setting um, for for a for an industry that is that is very cosmopolitan and very global. Like, how did it work um, in your conception of place? Really? Oh, kia ora. Thanks, um, Azadi. Um, yeah. Um... Yes, I think that it's been interesting to watch New Zealand. Um, I, you know, started hairdressing in the 1990s and um, we would always look to overseas, you know, and then um, what started to happen is several people came back from London, back from America, mainly London, um, which seemed, which is a huge centre of um, hairdressing at the time, you know, Tony and Guy, Vida Sassoon, and people would come back to New Zealand and open these salons that looked like London salons, and they would start to talk like London hairdressers, and for the first time ever, um, there was this odd um, feeling I remember going to see, um, there's a very famous hairdresser here um, whose last name is Seville and he opened a hairdressing salon called Seville's and I remember going to see um, a, a show he was putting on and I kept saying to everyone, where's he from, where's he from? And they were like, oh, um, Queen Street. And I was like, what? So I think there's been this odd growing up in New Zealand um, with the film industry, with the music industry, where we have started to instead of comparing ourselves with overseas, we've started to sort of think about ourselves here. And that is especially true in the fashion industry. Um, I feel like it's one industry in particular that we sort of, is that term called box above our weight? Like we, we definitely um, produce some beautiful clothes here. And because of primary industry, like, a, you know, we, we make wool here, um, you know, it, it's just this interesting thing. And, but I, and, and there's this interesting thing as well, which is hard to explain between Auckland and Wellington. Um, you know, Auckland feels like the commercial centre of New Zealand and Wellington is very much the political um, parliamentary centre. And um, yeah, having lived in both cities, there's this strange push and pull between the two of them. And I was really interested to investigate that. Um, you know, I, I love Auckland a great deal and um, I miss it a great deal, but there is no way I could afford to move back to Auckland, which is an odd feeling, you know. And um, But yeah, I think that is sort of the cultural centre of it. Um, yeah, I think that describes it. But I think we still do look to overseas as far as fashion goes. Although, yeah, I'm not sure anyway. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to ask... Um about the the kind of intergenerational um, kind of element of your novel. And, and I think, um, Guy, I'll ask you also about that because both of your novels um, have characters that sort of reflect uh, predilections, mores, um, attitudes um, that are clearly of um, a generation distinct from the younger characters uh, in, in your novels. Um, and 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 I and I really loved um, Pip how you kind of capture um, the the really determined sincerity of of the young millennials, um, the new sincere, the anti irony as you called it, um, and you know the way that they talk about corporate clothes for the man who's corporate resistant but like with a really straight face. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about what you saw as the cracks between these generations. Um, is it is it age? Is it class? Is it attitudes towards um, kind of what it means to be global? What attracts them to fashion? Like what was um, like? How do you how did you see those fr those fractures between them? Um, it was a real surprise to me when um, my publisher started talking about this as an intergenerational novel for me it's always been about class um it's always been about um yeah the the way that um there are some people who have always been told that they're that anything's possible and anything is possible for them because with money anything is possible I think and then there's other people that have worked really hard and had a thought that everything was possible but been locked out of that and for me it was always about class and that was always the distinction the extent to which um, class means what is formed about your idea of yourself and what people tell you about yourself and just um those limitations of capitalism like sorry it's early in the morning here but yeah just this idea of um this capitalist idea of exchange of labor for money and 
this lie i think new zealand is very much in love with this lie at the time of the writing we had a prime minister um who was was very much about pulling themselves up pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and if we worked hard enough we could have anything we wanted and those are the fishes that i see you know that this um you know and also there's a degree of guilt you know as someone from generation x you know we did a lot of loafing about and um I, i'll talk for myself i did a lot of loafing about i did a lot of you know like enjoying myself nihilistic living and i think that we've shortchanged the next generation in a way that i well i have i feel like i've shortchanged the next generation and you know i think that yeah i think there is a degree where we've sort of said you need to grow up you need to be sincere you need to work hard you know and i think you know i feel scared about saying that about a whole generation but i think those are sort of where i see the fishes lying you know like um yeah yeah but that's that's sort of where i see it i don't know what about you guy in your book that's so interesting um i'm gonna ask you a question later but um well in in my um in the book the inter inter intergenerational aspect of it was a way to sort of um on two levels one level was was to think about extremism and how it's manifested over time so one character um speaks about her experience in the 1980s in northern ireland during the troubles and another character um from west indian descent uh, speaks about his experience as a new uh, immigrant in London in the 1950s during sort of the Notting Hill race riots. Um, and so for me, it was interesting to to to, to um, almost graft that experience right next to 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 the experiences of of, of the kinds of extremism we see today. Um, and on another level, it's almost like again looking at the the language and how that's changed or actually hasn't. Um, how words in the mouth of someone in the 50s or the eight, or the 80s in terms of talk, speaking about themselves and their society and, and how they relate to extremes and sort of that proximity to violence and what it means for them. Mm. And then again, literally just transplanting it into a mouth of someone today and having to sort of confront um, extremes today. Um, how, what, what effect that, that has on, on, on how they think of themselves. And, and almost seeing again how how um, extremism sort of breeds a, a trauma that is inherited um, almost in, in a self-expression um, um, that that was interesting to me I, I again playfully I, in, I enjoyed writing about writing in, in the dialect of of um, sort of a, a northern Irish dialect as well as West Indian patois as well as a a sort of a, a mulchy young London road dialect thing, like putting those those things together um, in a way was 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 fun. Um, uh, it, uh, but it also spoke to me in in, in terms of um, just uh, thinking about self expression and class um, and um, heritage. Uh, what that really means in in a city like London, um, where you you really are sort of a product of uh, multiculturalism. At least I, I think I myself am. Um, um, it's interesting thinking about that in in terms of what you've just said Pitt, um, about those fishes. Um, yeah, that's that's how I thought about it at least. Um, you know. Uh... In terms of the the kind of intermingling of um, your your younger characters, Guy, um, and the way that they seem um, kind of less accommodating and less tolerant of those structural injustices that they've kind of inherited, whether directly, you know, in London or with the histories that they pull behind them, um, you know, I wondered whether you well you conceived of them so i don't mean to talk about them as real people who exist um but in in oh, being yeah. less accommodating and and being maybe um less tolerant of, of the kind of racism that they grew up with um i mean did you conceive of that um as making them sort of more seducible by the extremists who would sort of prey on their grievances and cultivate them was that something that you know they were maybe they didn't believe that they had all of this um 
you know, this opportunity. I think one of your characters says, um, Britain did not love me back. And this kind of existing on the fringes or somehow, I don't know, outside British identity definitely seems to be, you know, a struggle for both generations, but the younger one seems angrier about it. And maybe that makes them more susceptible. Um, that's interesting. No, I, I, I wouldn't say that's how I would think about it. But again, like when I was writing, it was all very sort of instinctual and kind of felt its way through. But think about it in that context. Um, or maybe I can ask it another way was kind of London and language, their identity, because they there's a there's like a sense of exclusion. And so they kind of take an identity or carve one out. And it seems very much um, specific to this place and the way people speak in it. Perhaps, I think um, it, it, there's, there's an, a, a reclamation going on uh, or um, you use the word conceive, like the idea of like just uh, creating something new and also just um, holding on to that sense of unbelonging almost. Um, I didn't choose to be born here. Um, doesn't seem like the narratives accept my own because they are narratives of multiplicity when you're supposed to be an English person or a British person. Or, you know, the, the, the narratives don't quite mirror the, <laughs> the experiences. And that, I don't think that's um, specific to London. That's probably true for most sort of globalized cities around the world. Um, um, I think the, the angriness, I don't know. I, I, I always felt in some of the characters in the book, the, the younger characters, um, I knew those guys. I, I knew those, the, 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 those young people who are sort of like, kind of had it with this idea of belonging or like home even. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of like a new animal, no? Like it, it's kind of like a, a a sense of going of, of taking ownership of that space in between. If that's where I am, that's kind of a it's almost liberating. I I, I think I feel that way. Like it, writing from that place is actually a you're, you're freer to express or interrogate actually and, and confront certain things that perhaps if you were sort of draped with a flag or, an, or a specific identity, you might not be able to explore. And I think that's what you see in, in some of the characters. Maybe that comes off angry because it's kind of a resistance. Um, mm -hmm. This is a difficult place to stake. Maybe you don't want to stake yourself anyway. You just want to yeah. exist <laughs> uh, fluidly in between some and, and, and tr transgress when you, where you can and where you feel comfortable. Um, I think that's a experience that I seem to have, I think, to, um, to uh, looked at with these younger characters. But again, when I was writing it, I wasn't really conscious of it. It was sort of mingled in. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned um, the new animals. And Pip, I wanted to ask you um, about that title. Tell us about that title and um, who are the new animals and, and how, do we, how do we think about them? How do we find them? Um, the title, I. I just have I am hopeless with titles I've never come up with my own title and um I just um yeah um someone at Victoria University Press an amazing amazing editor um came up with the title and um the way that I the way that I think about it one of the things that started me off um with the book is um the idea of bodies I'm really interested in the ways um that we live in bodies. Um, I'm often very confused by my body. I have a very odd relationship with it and, um, you know, not a particularly well relationship with it. And, um, but I was very interested in the way that um, bodies can adapt over a lifetime, like the way animals can adapt over a lifetime. Um, and, you know, this idea that we can build muscle and lose muscle, we can you know, like lose weight and gain weight, we can, um, you know, like if we, you know, I have a callus on my hand from writing with a pen, you know, these sorts of ideas really interested me. And um, 
um, you know, the second half kind of deals with that, like what happens if we put a body in water for a long time, that sort of thing. And I think, um, you know, and, and all these ideas of adorning ourselves, like the hair on our head is the hair that we groom and, you know, all these sorts of weird ideas. And also, I was very interested in this idea of humans as animals. Um, you know, I've always been interested in that idea um, and just sort of, yeah, the, the way that we act, um, oh, I keep saying we, I should say me, the way that I act like I'm some kind of different thing from the dog that I live with or some different kind of thing from the ants that are um, currently getting into our sugar, you know, but in reality, we're the same kind of biological soup. And um, yeah, the, the, these weird things that we live in that are kind of carbon based. And yeah, so it was kind of thinking about that. Um, and I guess um, also, yeah, like that idea of the new, the new, the new, you know, like being reinvented. And yeah, I just love something Guy was saying about, I was wondering about that intergenerational thing and like what activism looked like in the 90s and what it looks like now. And you know, like, I think that's the kind of thing, like, um, yeah, this reinvention, ad adaptation, those kind of things were really why I think the title hit me as such a good idea um, when, yeah, when, when it was suggested. So, yeah, I think, yeah, that's what I think, yeah. There's, can I just say one really odd thing that happened? This really odd thing happened here where um, there's a fast fashion um, outlet here. Um, I won't name them, but um, they um, took out a huge one-page ad um, about two months after the book won the prize, and it was the new animals. <laughs> and um, it was really strange because the lead, well, the character that I identify with, I, I did not see as the woman they used in the ad and I was just like oh my gosh you know like it was a really odd experience because I was like oh yes this is a new animal and I guess a new animal can be like a marketing idea as well yeah but it was this weird like kind of capitalism and <laughs> I don't know it was really strange but yeah that's yeah it was you weird. wrote it into reality <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh good I'll write clear skies and um cooler temperatures that would be good <laughs> um uh but I, I felt reading, um, I, I enjoy hearing you uh, talk about sort of your own, it's quite sensory. Like I almost felt like some of the characters have like an extra sense that I don't have. <laughs> Um, and it and it was um, it was it was just very visceral. Like and and when I read them describing or articulating that sense, I was like, that feels really real. I just don't think I have it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I could conceive of, you, you made me conceive of a being, a different animal, a human one, who did have that extra sense. So um, I thought that was very, very um, mm -hmm. beautifully done um, because it was so visceral. Um, so um, I also did want to ask you, Pip, um, you won this major prize, like New Zealand's biggest kind of fiction prize. And in terms of like a publishing journey, um, like, what did that change or did it change anything or did it recast how, um, like what you were doing with, with the book, how it was received? Um, uh, the, the prize came with a lot of money, which was, um, incredible. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the most important, um, decisions anyone makes when they want to become a writer is, um, how they're going to earn their money Be, because, you know, writing, I, I don't know what it's like over there, but, um, writing doesn't really pay over here. And so the money was huge. Like it meant that I could take a breath for a moment and think about, yeah, and what I think it really allowed me to do is the new animals was kind of written in fifteen minute lots. Like I, I with work and other responsibilities, I could only really afford fifteen minutes a day. But the money allowed me to spend a little bit more time on this book, which meant that it was a different type of book, which frightens me a lot because I sort of think that is capital and money and labor is that's what's dictating the types of books that are being written that that worries me a lot like how does someone working two shifts in a factory or cleaning and having a factory job or in a precarious position how did they write a book and how do we hear from them and you know all that sort of thing um so all those thoughts have sort of been carrying on in my mind and how maybe I can help in some way with that and all that sort of thing um uh my I, I mean, like, this makes me sound like a whiner, but um, my, my books have been quite harshly reviewed, um, like, um, and it was strange because this book got very bad reviews as well, and then it um, 
won the prize and um no one knew what to do with that in a way if you know what I mean like you know um people <laughs> I think people were confused and I think um yeah w- one of my other books won an award once and um there was outrage and yeah well not outrage it was a very small because we're a very small community here you know but and I just think I think the thing that it did for me is allow me that time to spend on this other book so this other the new book is a very different creature and I think um every now and then when yeah I mean writing's so strange I don't know if you find this guy but you know I feel like no one's waiting for my book no one's you know I just feel like if I never write again no one's really going to care and um but I think that every now and then I can sort of think about that prize and think at one time four people who were on a panel all thought it was an okay book and that can kind of help give me a little bit I don't know yeah that that's sort of where I yeah that that sorry that was a long-winded answer but yeah that's sort of what I think about that (laughs) um well do you want to tell us a little bit about the new book um I'm quite intrigued by the difference in having expansive time um versus versus bursts of time um and and what that does in terms of process or how you kind of even sit down and 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 approach structure or um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your next book? Well, I think this the new animals is episodic, you know, like it takes place in a short amount of time, which meant that I didn't have to think too much. This hap- it's um I think there's a word called um ped- I can't remember what the proper name is it, but you know, this happens which causes this to happen, which causes this to happen. You know, it was relatively easy. It's not as complex a structure as guy's book but you know this would happen then that would happen then that would happen um whereas this book I was able to have a little bit more room to make kind of a bigger web like it's told over a longer period this the new book um nothing to see and um it 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 means that I can put in place something here and then see how it affects something later on rather than having to have those events closer together which is really it just is that mind space um it's also a lot longer I think it's the longest book I've ever written and it's not very long um but yeah I think and also just being slightly more immersed in the language I loved what Guy said about that idea of language you know like um it's allowed me to sort of experiment a little bit more and there's been more time for research which has been really great as well so I've been able to use more than my you know more than just what I know to write the book you know which I think has been important for me yeah um but yeah that's that's what I think is the difference yeah thank you um, I wanted to ask you both about um, about your structures um, in in your in your present novels um, uh, because uh, it's quite striking um, to have one that's set in forty eight hours and one that's set in twenty four um, and and both of you um, I think both of your novels have a very strong sense of place I think place is character language is very much a character um, I think uh, but what is this condensation um, of time um, what do you leave in what do you leave out um, what does it mean for your development of your characters? Um, did it feel kind of freeing almost because your, your book ended, um, in, in a very kind of snug way? Um, I would just really be, be very interested to hear like both your thoughts on this condensation and sort of what it means. Oh no, you start. (laughs) Um... Well, I, I th- well, I don't, I don't know if it's all that interesting for me. Like it's, um, um, I always, I thought this, I thought about the idea of it, of the structure being kind of a spiral. So there is forward momentum, um, and it's sort of propulsion towards a, towards an end, and it, and the idea of, and the the themes in the book sort of lend to that. I think, um where things are almost out of control, but are going somewhere and each character is, is, is moving somewhere. And all this idea of also revisiting um, aspects of the theme over and over and over again until it, it hits a point to me, where is that point gonna go? And again, beginning a, a book without much thought and just kind of seeing where it was going, it was kind of exciting to kind of follow and seeing where the, the end point was. Um, there's a line in the book that um speaks to the sort of the the rhythms of it and the idea is um history is um not a circle but a spiral of violent rhymes this idea of each 
sort of spiral end being rhyming with another. So the extremism experience in, in at one particular time that doesn't look or um, feel much like this the, the the same as it is now, but it kind of rhymes. Um, that's that that's an uh, that's a that was an interesting idea for me to sort of explore and having it sort of um, set that way. Um, didn't I didn't honestly didn't think about it being in forty eight hours until my editor was like, "This is forty eight hours." My like, yes, it is. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, uh, but again, like it's forty eight hours and also not because like the experience of the older characters though was over a couple of years, but like the 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 present stories is I guess forty eight hours, but. Sorry, it wasn't that interesting. It wasn't so much I thought going into like that, that concise period of time. Um, Pip, and then also like, if you have any questions for each other, please uh, feel free to chime in with those too, because you, um, you might want to pose something directly to each other as well. Um, yeah, I, um, I love that idea of the spiral and like, I live in New Zealand, which is also called Aotearoa and like here implicit in the land and implicit in the people that, you know, are the, you know, the first people of this land and the, you know, the, the people of this land, um, there is this idea of time operating in a very different way, you know, um, and often, um, people talk about walking into the past and this idea of a spiral that all time is around us all the time. Um, I think that that is definitely, that's definitely something that was playing on me when I was thinking about those 24 hours, because, um, I feel like it's interesting to tell a story in, in the um, continual present, you know what I mean? Like, um, like trying to go back as little as possible um, because I feel like there is a way of writing that where all time is implicit, um, implicit in the moment. Um, when I wrote the book, I actually walked the book out. Like I went to Auckland for 24 hours and I had a timetable and I took the buses that Carla takes and I went for the walk that Elodie takes. And, you know, I went down to the water at five in the morning and looked at it. And um, so that the book takes place on a very real day. You know, the news articles that are on the radio are the same. And I think that that, that really made me aware that all time really is implicit in this moment that we're in, you know, like, um, yeah, like the whole history of the brutal colonization of this, this land that I live in, um, you know, the, the, the histories and histories of travel to here is implicit in the water that surrounds us. And yeah, so I think that, um, yeah, I think I think that it's it's interesting. Um, this idea of the spiral, I think, is so awesome. Guy, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, I was <laughs> sorry. I'm just going to take up that um, offer. Um, yeah. I'm so interested in the running in your book, like in the um, the body in motion, and um, I guess I I'm always scared of that idea that um, you know books uh you know biographical uh, autobiographical but I just wonder um what how did the running help with the movement of the book but also is that an experience like are, are you a do you run you know like that kind of thing like I just wondered I really love it and I just wondered about it oh that's I love that kind of question because that's so <laughs> geeky in a great way you know like it's so specific I, I love that's the kind of question I, I ask. Like, what's up with that? Um, I can't, I think that it, it, Stelvon has a, a weird sort of stilted way of expressing himself. It's all quite abrupt um, compared to the other characters. And there's something about that sort of, so I do this, I think that's just how I kind of feel. It's how I feel about him. It's kind of like there's, there's a thudding, um, sort of a hardness and um, the way he experiences his surroundings is quite abrupt and confrontational. Just the idea of his foot hitting the concrete as opposed to anything else. Like, that's how he kind of, he resists it. Um, he pushes everything away, <laughs> I guess. That's how, I, how it feels to me. It just made sense, I guess, in, in terms of the way he expressed himself. The idea of had, I had of him experiences, experiencing his surroundings. Um, I, but again, like, I don't know if you feel the same way, but a lot of like the intellectualization about it happens after you finish it, you know, like that kind of felt right back then. But now I think about it because you asked me a question, I think, I guess, 
you know, I guess that, that feels right, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I have a question for you. Um, you spoke about structures and how before it was sort of, you were talking about the episodic structure of it and, and how now you're, you're um, changing it up, I guess. But I, does that happen while you're writing and it's sort of, do you kind of see it emerge with the writing? Um, to the point where it's quite drastic. You're like, oh, that's what that book's trying to do. Let me just change everything and sort of augment what I've already written to that structure. Or do you sort of think, well, this book is going to have this structure and you're just going to plow on? Yeah, it's a really... I um, I so love this idea um, that you're talking about of making sense of things afterwards. You know, like um, I got to see George Saunders a couple of weeks ago and he said this really amazing thing about how the story is often smarter than I am. And I really relate to that. Like, I think that if I give room and if I can let go enough, like if I can let go of, especially around ego, you know what I mean? Like, I know um, I've always wanted to write a big book. Like I, um, I, um, absolutely love you know um, luminaries by Eleanor Catton I love um, you know the tunnel I love all those you know I liked David Foster Wallace but he turns out to be an asshole but you know like I love really big books and I've always wanted to write a big book and you know like it's never worked for me because that is not the story that's wanting to come out you know which sounds all you know like ooky, you know like I don't know Los Angeles hippie but you know like and I think that if I can let go long enough of ideas and if I can be willing to sacrifice ideas a the the right one will come through you know and then afterwards in hindsight like you say reading it I'll think ah oh, actually the story knew more than I did about that you know and um I think also it's often about my inability like I think that my inability often structures the book you know like and that's definitely what happened in the new animals like I don't know how to write a novel I wrote a collection of short stories then I wrote a collection of short stories that I pretended was a novel <laughs> then I wrote this which is two short stories jammed together and you know like I mean I didn't know how chapters worked so it had to happen within a short period of time because I didn't know how you went how you leapt you know from you know like yesterday to next month so yeah I think I think I really relate to what you're saying and I think also that um yeah it, it just unfolds what do you think? Like, I mean, can same I ask you same. the same question? Yeah, same, like, yeah. Same, 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 man. That's, um, yeah, it seems so familiar to me. Um, and I don't think it's all that mystical. I don't think that's like, it is, it is really like, that's how it works. And it, I kind of, I was so embarrassed about expressing it that way. But as you have said, like, that's kind of what happens. It's, you kind of trust in something. Um, there isn't something, it's probably just your subconscious going, mm, this is what you're obsessed by. Let's pepper that in. And after a while, you kind of see things repeat. When you read stuff through, after you spend a couple of months on it, you're like, oh, that's what I'm thinking about. That's weird. <laughs> Let me just explore that a bit. Um, but the, the structure stuff really, I, 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 I know about, I, I know what you mean about the idea of just inability, just not really knowing what the rules are and just going, well, this is, this works now i think it resonates i don't know what other people think but right now it makes sense um mm. yeah and the idea of it being smarter than you um that's really true isn't it because yeah like i mean that i i don't know i think a lot about dreams you know like i just yeah I don't know like I think you're right I think they're like I I always have this thing that I say which sounds wanky but I just can't like it's the truth for me is that I'm always writing to work out things you yeah. know the world confuses me people confuse me power confuses me money confuses me everything confuses me so often it's so um narcissistic in that way that I'm just like yeah. I don't understand yeah. this you know yeah, like that's, yeah that's so and, yeah that's exactly it right like sorry I, that's so that's so that's exactly what I feel. You've articulated exactly how I feel about working through, and you're not even what you're not even thinking about finding an answer. You're not expecting a couple of answers to show up. Going, oh, this is how I definitely feel about it. But you somehow there is an acceptance of not knowing so much because you kind of work through how you feel about it. Yeah. Mm. And it's almost like you. The thing that I almost am looking for is to complicate it more. You know what I mean? Like I want to you know, like I, I, 
I get in a bit of trouble with my friends because I'm very changeable. You know, like what I believed last week, I'm challenging this week. Mm. And I think that that's what I enjoy about writing is that we're not writing towards an answer. You know, like I... I'm almost writing towards wanting to be more confused by something sometimes, you know, which just seems so, um, I don't know, like I, I, it feels like if it's confusing, I'll keep my hands off it and let it unfold or something. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. It's really weird. <laughs> um, there's a, a question from Twitter that I could pose to both of you, um, if, if you would be so inclined. Um, somebody would like to know, how productive uh, do you feel you need to be under lockdown? Um, how are you all doing? Which I think is um, sort of interesting to, to just ask how you're um, creatively um, functioning, if at all, um, in this very strange period that we're all experiencing. I'd be interested too. Thank you, Twitter person, for this question. Um, I, um, I'm in an interesting position because I am also in a workshop with writers and we're, you know, they're trying to write, I'm trying to write, and we're trying to work out what that looks like in this particular moment in time. Um, I feel excited because anytime something's broken, I get quite excited. Like anytime something's crushed and, you know, raised to the ground, I think, oh, what's going to happen now? Um, because I haven't got, you know, I've only got black and white thinking. I don't have any gray area thinking. What I've found incredible is that um, the one thing I've been doing, the one discipline I've been having is I have a podcast and every morning I've been recording a writing exercise. Um, I started doing it because um, my student, there was a suspension to our teaching and I couldn't, you know, we couldn't teach or learn um, so I started doing these um, exercises for um, the people that I was working with and the writers that I was working with and that has been so interesting because um, that has I've been unable to write anything fiction wise or anything like that but those exercises seem to be helping me way more than anyone else <laughs> you know just to sort of start thinking creatively because often an exercise is an undoing of um, you know some element of craft so that's the one thing I have been doing and I recorded an interview with um, an amazing poet yesterday Jackson Newland about their new book and so you know like that this reaching out and kind of like, yeah, that, that I think has actually been, that's been what's sustaining me far more than writing, which is odd for me because I, yeah. And at the moment, like right now, I feel like I may never write anything ever again, which um, I'm trying to be okay with. And I think I am okay with, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. I don't know. How about you guy? I, have you written like four novels and, you know, <laughs> well, uh, I think that, um, I've had a conversation with a few like sort of artist friends, musicians and other writers and, and whatnot. Um, I, the one thing that I love about novel writings, I'm only like a book and a bit in, so like it might change, <laughs> but I like the idea of it being just a, a very long-term project, like a couple of years. That feels really good to me. Some people are put off by that completely, but like for me, the, the, the writing of it is kind of the best bit. Um, and once it's done, it's kind of like, right, you have it. I'm like doing that was great. So just having a book to finish this year um, has been a help. I think that uh, some of my other friends haven't had, like they, they're thinking about what to do now. And inevitably the question comes up, do I make something out of this sort of crisis? Do I make something out of this experience? But I have one thing to do every morning. And that's what I'm doing. Like I've got nothing else to, to think about. Or inevitably I know that some weird osmosis will make, make the coronavirus appear in a book somehow. Like I know like somehow in some weird allegory metaphorical way like it's gonna crop up maybe in this book maybe the next but i kind of like the idea of it just simmering and surprising me one day going oh, remember how you felt in may there is you know like I, I like that idea more than right let me try and wrangle this into something now there's yeah uh, oh sorry <laughs> No, 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 you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that um, 
yeah, I feel like I feel like there is this um, society. I don't know what it's like over there, but I feel like there's a society wide psychosis over here. And like, um, you know, like to begin with, it was very positive. You know, I think that often that was kind of yeah like it, there was this really strange I'm going to do this I'm going to do that I'm going to do this and lots of people were making sourdough and um yeah I think that we are going I think we're gonna we're, I think we're falling off you know what I mean like so I think this idea of being productive you know and and I think being in the position I'm in it's been interesting like how do you talk about other writers that you support about being productive in this time you know and in that weird I teach in um, a, a place where there are structured deadlines and stuff like that and yeah it's 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 a very I, I just think we should um, I don't know I've tried to just lay off myself a bit but I love I really love what Guy said about you know it, it that I, I one of the things I love about writing is the graft of it you know like that there's work to do and it's done and yeah I just think it's really great sorry that was a blather but yeah <laughs> no it was, well I'm hoping you can um send over those writing exercises to me um, <laughs> okay. it sort of like pummels me a little bit or like you know that, that that's something that I can use to get going um would would be great um there's another question um, about uh, asking how lockdown is um, in your countries. And you're both in interesting countries because New Zealand is supposed to have a really smart response because you have this uh, strong, smart female leader. And there's been positing that uh, female leaders are handling responses better than men. And um, Guy, you're in Sweden right now that took this sort of outlier method that was going to outsmart the whole thing. And you're kind of semi-functional and it, it's not, you know, uh, it hasn't been a total tragedy. So um, maybe you could just talk a little bit briefly about how it's going in your corners of the world. Um, in Sweden, it's quite unnerving and, and strange because it's not as apparent as elsewhere. I, I you know, the, the worry is still there because I think about my parents and stuff still in the UK. Um, but uh, no, everything is kind of open here and you're allowed to go out and we do. Um, there are certain things that, you know, that large groups of people aren't allowed, but that's kind of it. It's all very, um, as I say, strange. Um, so like watching it all on TV and hoping the TV doesn't explode in your living room, you know, that's how it feels. But it, um, but I, I, it's a strange one because I, I had this conversation earlier about um, this being a strange, a very unique uh, collective global event where before there's usually some sort of image for people to latch onto and sort of project their own fears onto or or prejudices sometimes depending on what kind of event it is um, but there isn't one here and what that means is everyone just has to sit with that feeling we hear horrific stories and we hear like the the kind of reportage that comes out of hospitals and stuff but there isn't in a world saturated with imagery this there isn't one here to, to focus all our energies on um, and I think that's where the sourdough comes in, where everyone's just kind of finding something else to stress out about. <laughs> and I, I, you're right though, you're, we are falling off and sooner or later, we're gonna have to deal with the idea of being with ourselves, um, which I think mm, is when maybe the writing and other stuff will kick in. Um, but as in terms of how it is here, it's, it's weird, man. It, I can't lie, it's strange. And, Everyone's looking around going, are we doing it wrong? <laughs> That's how it feels. Yeah, and I mean, um, oh man, I get so scared answering questions like this because, um, you know, this is, this is something that should have hit evenly but has not hit evenly at all. Right. I don't think anywhere in the world. Like, I mean, um, you know, I have friends where all jobs in a house have gone at once you know and um there's been some help with that you know and, and we've got a weird thing happening here where there's been mortgage relief but no rental relief and we're a huge renting um nation like um very few people own their own houses and um you know that in general people own two or three houses and rent you know a very small amount of people do that and um so I think that there have been some things that have been done exceptionally well, um, you know, like communication has been amazing, um, you know, like, um, yeah, the, the, I think that um, 
yeah, I, I think a lot of it has done, been done very well, but I think what we're seeing is a failure that we've been building up to. You know, we, we've sort of privatised almost everything. Um, you know, we have this these inequalities which are just unbelievable. Um, and I think that that's, the problem is structural. I think, I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm not the prime minister. She knows what she's doing. She's amazing. But it, it's a very interesting thing. And I think also because of the size of New Zealand, things are hitting a lot harder. You know, like, um, you know, I had a very good friend who's um, a family member passed away last week and they had to have this small funeral of, um, you know, and, and like, I mean, to a lot of people in New Zealand, you know, the, um, the, the, um, the right way to to bury people and stuff like that it's it's been very difficult to do that um yeah i i think it it's really it, it's really interesting being here because it's this weird thing where we're all doing this for each other like this is probably the most unselfish thing everybody's done like everybody's going by the rules staying inside you know caring for other people you know by doing that but we're sort of all doing it separately so there's all these very different experiences with it and I, I really like that thing that you're saying about that central sort of image or idea and um yeah it's it's very it's very interesting and um yeah it's really it, it, it's interesting here but yes and I think it's interesting that idea of um you know gender minorities perhaps being better at you know, like um, this, and I, someone posited something which I really liked the other day, which was that when you're a minority of any kind, um, you know, be it gender or other um, ethnic or whatever um, minority, you have to work so much harder to get to where you're going, you know, like you have to, you know, especially I think with, um, you know, female presenting people, we need to be reasonable, you know, we can't be a nag. And I think that there's something to be said about that and the approach of um, Jacinda Ardern, you know, she, she's made sure she's got the facts. She um, is relatively reasonable when she talks. She hasn't lost her temper. She's been, yeah, so I think all those sorts of things are kind of interesting to think about. But yeah, yeah, it's it's weird here. We're in a stage where we are completely locked down, but we're, everyone's calling it like lockdown with takeaways because it's just been decided that we can um, get food and um, several motorways were blocked while people got, um, fast food so yeah it's we're, we're a lot happier now that we can get mcdonald's and kfc here so yeah <laughs> um well uh everything i i guess small small comforts and and small um i guess in a way that sort of um like some sort of resemblance of normalcy in in its own way um well um I think we're sort of drawing to uh, the end of our hour. So I wanted to thank you both very, very much. Um, it's, it's, been, um, it's been really a pleasure uh, speaking to you both and, and hearing you uh, converse with each other. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much as a day as well. It thank was a real you. cool to meet you. Thank you. Well, well, <laughs> it's, it's really been um, definitely the highlight of my week. Um, and I look forward to um, reading, reading uh, your next work, both of you. Um, I might bother you, Pip, for writing exercises. Um, so, so thank you to also everyone at home um, for joining Bookbound 2020 for this event. Um, there are lots of great events like this on the program, so please uh, search for that on Twitter, Instagram, your favorite platform, um, and you will find more, and you can spread the word at using the hashtag Bookbound2020. Um, if you'd like to buy the work of our authors, the links are in the text below the video, and they will take you to Hive, which is an online bookseller which supports independent bookshops and you can uh, find links to the books that we've been discussing. You can find a discount code uh, for festival titles uh, and you will also find all of our favorite independent bookshops across the globe which is a kind of cool thing to check out. Uh, you can also find the Just Giving link uh, to donate to those charities that I mentioned earlier, the mental health charities. Um, so thank you very much again uh, to both of you. Uh, good night um, to Sweden. Uh, good morning to New Zealand um, and, and hope that we all um, convene again, um, maybe in person, hopefully in the future. Hope so.